the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, with hearts thy faith, and kindle on the fire of thy love. Set forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O oh God, to instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant that the light of the saints, good glory, is truly wise, and rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ, O Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. 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 St. Pius X, our lady help of Christians, and give you good success. St. Teresa, the child teacher, so to be confirmed, do you know the Ten Commandments, the Seven Sacraments, the gifts of the Holy Ghost? What else, Emily? Um, was it the incarnation, the redemption? No. There it is. And 12 fruits. 12 fruits. So that's not essential. Good to know them. How many of you know the 12 fruits? What are they, Leah? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. 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 Is that any of the fruits? Okay. All right, good. Is there any more of them that you can uh, I mean, I'll try. Charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, long-suffering, mildness, faith, modesty, constant, suggestive. Yeah, she left out long-suffering. Mm. Mm. Chastity. Mm. Remember, it's why you come up by self control. <laughs> oh, all right. That's what I was Not by self control, chastity. Okay. All right. So, uh, good. So, we're looking at the. Uh, is this our marker here? Or is this our marker here? Are we on the, the church or are we on Holy Communion? No, we're on Holy Communion. We're on Holy Communion. So, this must be our marker here. Okay. What do we call it when, uh, uh, what happens at Mass? The bread turns into what? Julia? Um, the body? The body what body? Our Lord's body. Our Lord's body. Yes, very good. And Joseph, what happens to the wine? Um, it turns into the blood. The blood. Is your name Joseph? Your name is Julia. When I call on Joseph, I don't mean Julia to answer. Okay, what do we call that change? Zachary? Transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. Right. That's, is that the only time transubstantiation happens? Yeah. When a tadpole turns into a frog, is that transubstantiation? Yeah. No. Why not? Because we... Why not, Emily? Because it's still, the tadpole is a baby frog, so it's still yeah, involved in that. The substance? Could you? It's changing physically and spiritually. Yeah, the appearances change as well, right? With transubstantiation, the appearances don't change. So when a tadpole turns into a frog, you have uh, the appearances change. But when our Lord changed water into wine, that wasn't transubstantiation, was it? Because it no longer had the taste of water, now had the taste of wine. It no longer had the look of smell of water, now had the smell of wine. See, the appearances change. So with transubstantiation, the appearances don't change, only the substance changes. Yes. So our Lord did that. Is Jesus Christ, okay, uh, who wants a, uh, Teresa, is it Teresa or Tres? Uh, either one. Okay, Teresa. Is Jesus Christ whole and entire both under the appearances of bread and under the appearances of wine? Um, wait, sorry, she said Is that. Jesus Christ whole and entire both under the appearances of bread and under the appearances of wine? Um, yes. Are you sure? That was kind of a doubtful yes. That was like a. <coughs> yeah. That wasn't an uh, adamant yes. No. What do you say, Joseph? No. You say no. Oh, all right. Why not? You don't know. You're just being disagreeing. <laughs> no, the answer is yes. Jesus Christ is whole and entire, both under the appearance of bread and under the appearance of wine. 
That's why we don't give out Holy Communion under both forms, because our Lord says you have to eat my bread and drink my eat my body and drink my blood. If you want to have blood within me, when we receive the host, we both eat our Lord's body and drink his blood. Why is he whole and entire under both the appearances of bread and wine? This is a tough question now. Who wants a hard question? Benny. You don't know. Just say I don't know. Don't say I'm not sure. Zachary. It's because he's God and he can do anything. No. That's correct, but it's not that. Uh, Jet. Jet. You can't separate his body and blood because he's already risen. Yeah, he's alive. Yes, he's alive. So his body, blood, and uh, his soul and divinity are all together and they can't be separated again. He's not going to die again. When he, oh, when he died, he died. And then when he rose, he rose. And he's not going to die again. He rose forever now. See, so he's alive. So his body and blood are together. So it's only a, a mystical separation of his body and blood at the sacrifice of the Mass. So it's not a real separation because the... Uh, he's, got, he's alive and he's he sending into heaven with his body and blood together, so uh, you can't separate it. Very good, Jeff. Yes. Okay. How was our Lord able to change bread and wine to his body and blood? That's an easy question. Leone. How was, we weren't paying attention, were you? How was our Lord able to change the bread and wine into his body and blood? Yeah, he can do anything. Very good. He is all. He's almighty. <laughs> all power. So he can do anything. <coughs> so he can. Yes. Does this change of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ continue to be made in the church? Also, do you say no? That's a contrary. Anastasia, does that change continue to be made in the church? When? You don't know when? Emily? At mass? At mass, yes, at mass, of course. Through the ministry of his priests. So this change of bread and wine in the body and blood of Christ continues to be made in the church by Jesus Christ through the ministry of his priests. So ordained priests have the power to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. So now today we got people that are priests, but we don't know for sure if they're ordained or not. So, so we don't know sure if they have that power or not, because if they're not ordained, they don't have that power. So this is part of the crisis in the church, where uh, they've changed all the sacraments, and we don't know if they actually make priests or anymore, or bishops anymore. We don't know if the bishop is a bishop now, so if he's a priest or if he's just a layman. That he's just a layman, he cannot change the body and blood into Christ. This is what happens, see, at the new Mass, everybody says the words of consecration along with the priest. That's what they do often, in some, not every place, of course, in some places. Uh, I know one man told me he had it almost memorized, the whole, the whole canon he had memorized because he said the whole thing with the priest. But when he says it, nothing happens. So, uh, only when the priest says that something happens. How do priests exercise their power to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ? Zachary? By prayer. By prayer? By saying the rosary? No, not by saying the rosary. Emily, come on, that was a silly answer by prayer. By celebrating the Mass? By celebrating the Mass, and especially by saying what? Rosary, no, not quite the same. The rosary. This, this, is the ro this is my body, and this, this is, is my, my body. body. Yes, the words of consecration. This is the, my, my body. This is the chalice of my blood, which we shed for you and for many on the remission of sins. Yes. Yeah, that's when they exercise that power. Yes. So see, when the priest is exercising the power, that he takes the place of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal high priest, and he's the, he's the principal priest at every Mass, but he uses the ministry of an ordained priest. So the ordained priest doesn't say, this is our Lord's body, he says, this is my body. But is it his body? No, it's our Lord's body. 
because he's speaking on behalf of our Lord. He's lending his voice to, to Jesus, but he's speaking on behalf of Jesus. That's why we say a priest is an altar of Christus. The priest is taking Jesus' place. That's correct, yes. He's taking Jesus' place. And, uh, he's lending his words. It's still Jesus that actually makes the transubstantiation take place. See? By his almighty power. Why does Christ give his own body and blood in the Holy Eucharist? <coughs> this is a harder question. Why does he give us to us in the Holy Eucharist? There's three answers. First, second, and third. The first one you won't know, probably. What's the second one? Repeat his suffering. That's not. So we can receive Holy Communion. So that's exactly, that's the second reason. So we can receive Holy Communion to be re received by the faithful in Holy Communion. You won't be able to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion if our Lord didn't change. And the Holy Communion is the highest of the sacraments, isn't it? Why is it the highest of the sacraments? Uh, uh, Max. Because you're receiving our Lord's body and blood. Yes. Yeah. What do we receive? What's this, what's the definition of a sacrament, Max? Uh, no, no, don't you don't know the definition of a sacrament? Jet. Uh, that word sign is instituted by our Lord to give grace. That's right. The sacrament is an outward sign instituted by our Lord to give grace. So the sacraments give grace. They give sanctifying grace. So when you receive baptism, you get grace. When you receive confirmation, you get grace. But when you receive Holy Communion, <coughs> you receive our Lord, who is the author of grace. He's the source of grace. See? So that's where, that's why you're receiving actually our, Holy, our Lord's body and blood. You do receive grace because it's a sacrament. But you receive the author of grace, and that's why it's the highest of the sacraments. See? So the sacraments go up in a in a hierarchy. So we got Holy Eucharist at the top. And all the sacraments are related to the Holy Eucharist. So it starts out with what's down here? Baptism. You say it louder, I can't hardly hear that one. Baptism. Confession. What's after baptism? Confirmation. Confirmation. Confirmation completes Baptism. And then what's next? No, Holy Eucharist. And then we have penance and extreme unction. And what do they do? What does penance do? Uh, we just forgive sins that are committed after baptism. That's right, it forgives sins, so it removes the obstacles to receiving Holy Communion. So the obstacles are sins can't make a, a worthy Holy Communion if you have mortal sin, and even venial sin, you have to make an act of contrition first and be sorry for it, right? So penance removes the obstacles to receiving Holy Communion, and extra monction perfects penance. It, re it, receives, it removes more obstacles. What obstacle remains after a good confession? What obstacle to Holy Communion remains after a good confession? No. Is it, is, it only, just, is it only one problem? Only you? one obstacle? Is it only one? Well, what's, can you name one? Can you name two? Uh, I was going to say, I was sort of considering what the question was about, but... No, 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 those aren't obstacles to receiving worldly Holy Communion. Those are outside of us. I mean, uh, otherwise, like St. Vincent de Paul would be able to receive a worldly Holy Communion because he lives in the world, he's got the flesh, and he's got the devil around him. What obstacle remains after a, whole, a, a whole confession? Is it sorrow for your sins, or? Well, you're, you know, you have to have sorrow for your sins before you go to confession, don't you? That's not an obstacle. That's good. That's help. That's a helpful. That removes obstacles. Sorrow for sins. Mr. Joiner, do you have something to say? An obstacle to going to taking holy communion, holy communion would be not fasting. Oh right, but that's not yeah, that's that's not that's not what we're talking about here. 
Well, what remains after confession? What evils? What evil remains? The devil. Well, the devil's outside of you. What evil remains inside of you, Emily? Do we still have some sin on us? Oh, let's make a good confession. Max? Could it be temptation? No. Could it be the, stain, the stains of the sins? Uh, some scars of the sins, maybe, yes. Inclinations, evil inclinations. We still got temporal punishment. Temporal punishment, too. So you still haven't done your punishment. That's still, a, that's still an obstacle. That's something that's got to be gotten rid of. So the temporal punishment, very good. That remains after a good confession. So you still have some temporal punishment. So extra unction removes all the temporal punishment due to sin, doesn't it? That's what extra unction does. It forgives the sins if you have sins, but it also removes the temporal punishment due to them. So that uh, perfects you uh, more perfect in uh, penance. So these are prepares for penance. And then what other sacraments do we have? Matrimony and holy orders. And how, what's matrimony? How is that related to uh, holy holy communion? You're supposed to receive it when you're married. You're supposed to. Yes. It's a very easy question. None of you are married. That's why. Uh, what? <laughs> we are. So. Oh well, it symbolizes the union between our Lord and His Church. Yes. What does it really, what's it, what is that, what does it have to do with Holy Communion, matrimony? There is a mass. Obviously. Very, very, very simple question. Not complicated at all. Uh, Angela. Are not united. Pardon me? United. United. Wow. This is easy. All right, what's the purpose of matrimony? William. To get each other to him. Uh, well, that's not the first purpose. Are what? children married? Who said children? Emily. Emily, yes, it's to provide first communicants. So without matrimony, we have no first communicants, would we? So we need matrimony to get first communicants. So that's, what, that's how matrimony is. Provide people to receive Holy Communion. That's, what's pur that's his purpose. Because when a baby's born, you, he's got to be directed towards receiving Holy Communion. Right. And then Holy Orders is so that we have the Holy Eucharist itself, right? So we have the Mass. So all the sacraments are related to that. But the Holy Eucharist, or Holy Communion, is the highest of the sacraments. So second to be received by the Holy Communion. So the question was, why does Christ give us his own body and blood in the Holy Eucharist? And I told you the second answer was the easiest one, and Emily got that. To be received by the faithful in Holy Communion. <clears throat> now it says, for the first answer, to be offered as a sacrifice commemorating and renewing for all time the sacrifice of the cross. So the Mass is both a sacrament and a sacrifice. Right? So it commemorates and renews. It represents, it makes present again. What does it mean to be present? No, it doesn't mean you're happy. Leah, present. It means right now, you're doing something like it doesn't mean you're doing something. What does it mean, Anastasia? Present. You're there. You're there, yes. To be present means you're here. So to represent means you bring present again. So we bring present again the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross, but in an unbloody manner, as foretold by the prophets. Everywhere there will be a clean oblation, a clean sacrifice. See, the sacrifices of the Old Testament were not clean. You know, they, they'd kill a cow and there'd be blood all over and they'd pour the butt on the altar. You know, blood attracts flies, and so there's flies and all this. And it wasn't a clean sacrifice. Then they have to wash the altar afterwards, see? Because it's got all this uh, blood on it and all the parts of the body of the cow or whatever it is, you know? So it's, uh, when you make it an abattoir, the abattoirs are not clean places. So that's what the sacrifice of the Old Testament was. So now we have a clean oblation. A clean sacrifice. So our Lord is offered in an unbloody manner, but it's the same sacrifice as he did in a bloody manner on the cross. Right. And third, to remain on our altar, so we have the real presence. This is the third reason. So we have the real, we call it the real present, that our, our Lord is really present 
on the altar. How do we know our Lord is on the altar? Vinny? Red candles, one reason, yes, that's one way. Yes, what's another way? Vinny? The door is closed. Door is closed and it has a veil on the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. The tabernacle veil. So, but there's no tabernacle veil. You say, is our Lord there? Because our Lord's always veiled. Mm -hmm. so the tabernacle veil and the red candle. Yes, those are the indications. We know we come into the church. Uh, now they don't use a tabernacle veil in the new church anymore. But they probably don't have our Lord present there anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's the Holy Eucharist. So confirmation, after you're confirmed, you should make better Holy Communions than you do right now. And that perfects baptism, doesn't it? Why is baptism imperfect, Benny? Because it makes you a child of God. It makes you a child of God. And the child's not yet perfect. He's got to grow up, doesn't he? You've got to grow up to become perfect, don't you, Julia? Yeah. Yes, you do. You've got to do a lot of growing up. Yes. Okay. So we have to grow up and become mature. And we're perfect. See? So confirmation makes you perfect. A strong and perfect Christian. And so a strong and perfect Christian is supposed to make a holier holy communion than a child. It's not always the case. Sometimes a strong and perfect Christian is a big sinner. So, uh, but it's supposed to make you a holy, so you can make a holier holy communion. It prepares you to make a good holy communion. And so they can lead you <laughs> to becoming a saint. <coughs> okay. Any questions on the Holy Eucharist? All right, then we have the sacrifice of the Mass. That's the next chapter. What is the Mass? Pauline. The unbody sacrifice, the unbody version of the crucifixion. That's correct, yes. Let's see what it says here. The Mass is a sacrifice of the new law, in which Christ, through the ministry of the priest, offers himself to God in an unbloody manner. You got that right? Under the appearances of bread and wine. What do you mean by the new law? Leah. New covenant? The new covenant, yes. Emily. The rule of Jesus in the New Testament is supposed to be the Old Testament rule? That's right. What is it? The Testament, see, the Testament ended. The Old Testament, a Testament is when uh, uh, well, it was the agreement between God and Moses. Right? And the Testament, St. Paul says you always have to have the shedding of blood for a Testament break into effect. It's only it comes when the testator dies. So in the Old Testament, Moses didn't use his own blood, but he used the blood of a calf or something. He sprinkled all the people with blood. That's another thing they used to do in the Old Testament. And we sprinkle it with water. Well, you know, Moses would come along and sprinkle you with blood. You go, oh, that's nice. But that's what that's what he was told to do by God. That was the that was the Old Testament. They used blood. So he sprinkled you with all with blood. And then um, the blood of the lamb. Hmm. So. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's a sacrifice of the new law. The new law took place and came into effect when our Lord died on the cross then. And the old law was finished. Because the purpose of the old law was, what was the purpose of the old law, Benny? To prepare for our Lord's coming. Prepare people for the coming of the Messiah, for the coming of our Lord, so that they would be ready to greet him. To welcome him. So the Israelites should have been uh, op welcoming our Lord with open arms, but they didn't like him. They said, Oh, this is what we're expecting. Because they had a false expect expectation of the Messiah that they made themselves, not that they got from Moses, but they made themselves a false expectation of the Messiah. And so <clears throat> they wanted somebody to bring a big army and kick the Romans out, defeat the Romans, and make them the masters of the world, like the Romans were the masters of the world. See? When our Lord came, the Romans ruled the whole world. And they wanted to they wanted to rule the whole world. They wanted a Messiah that would come and conquer the Romans, conquer everybody, enslave everybody else, and make them the masters of the world. And when our Lord came, 
uh, and, and he didn't come as a rich king with armies and all this, but they said, you're not the Messiah, so you're rejecting him. I said, you're not the one we're looking for. You're not what we're expecting. So, but that was the purpose of the old law, to prepare them to receive our Lord. And some were properly prepared, like the shepherds. Shepherds received our Lord and they believed. And <coughs> others did too, of course. Okay. Where do we get the name Mass? Does anybody know? Leah? Zachary? Where we get the word mass? The chapel. That's where we say the well, that's where we say the mass. Where do we get the word? Well, a mass is a they call the people. Yeah. Oh, like a mass, yeah. No, that's not that's no relation to that at all. That's an English word. You're taking it into an English word. Mass comes from the Latin, not from the English. They didn't know they didn't know English. They were calling it a mass before English was even really invented. Uh, so. Did it come from an altar? Is it Nobody knows? Yet. Um, William? Alright, it comes from when we say Ita Misa Est. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Mass is. Mm -hmm. Ita Misa. They used to say that twice at Mass. When did they say it the first time in the old days, Emily? Um, I'm not sure. Pardon me? I'm not sure. Okay, does anybody know what the two parts of the Mass are? Emily? Is it, was it at the end of the Mass of Catechumens? At the end of the Mass of the Catechumens, yes, all the Catechumens were kicked out. They were saying, go. Go for you. Right. Ita means go. <coughs> now when the priest says, Ita means S, does everybody get up and go? <laughs> no, because we've added more onto the Mass since then. See? In the old days, that was the end. But now, it's not the end anymore. Now we have the last Gospel. And then we have the uh, prayers after Mass, the Hail Marys after Mass. And so we have more. But at the, at the beginning of the church, that was the end. So the priest says, go. Mass is, so he still says, go, but nobody goes now. Ita means go. What is the name? So, pardon me? What is the name? Yeah, you're disobeying. Yes. <laughs> because the, the, the rules have changed. You're supposed to disobey now. You're supposed to disobey that command. You're supposed to delay, obey, you delay your obedience. That's what you're supposed to do. Delay your obedience, yes. Okay, that's where we get that word, though. Okay, mass. Okay. Now, what is a sacrifice? We'll, we'll finish with this, maybe. What is a sacrifice? Maybe not. Uh, Celine, what's a sacrifice? Um, is it an Something like sacrifice? Yes, something makes sacred. That's what the word means. Very good. Yes, to make sacred. Sacrifice means make sacred. So, what is a sacrifice? Emily? It's the offering of a victim, which makes it holy to God. Offering of a victim to God. Very good. Yes, that's correct. Offering of a victim to God. A sacrifice is offering a victim by a priest. So, only a priest can offer a victim to God and make a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they had the priests were different from the uh, uh, people, right? Uh, so what does Misa mean? Misa means to be sent. You get a mission. We have mission. We have mission to send someone, yes. Sent. Oh, go. Mass is, yes. Okay, a sacrifice is offered by a victim by a priest. So it has to be a priest to make a proper sacrifice. So since the time of... Uh, Aaron. Before Aaron, other people offered sacrifices. They were they were like they took the place of priests. Like Abel offered sacrifice, didn't he? And Cain offered sacrifice. And Noah offered sacrifice. They were offering sacrifices, but the priesthood wasn't established yet. So the first priesthood was the priests according to the right of Aaron. Who was Aaron? He was Moses' Moses' brother? Moses' brother, yes, and he was the first high priest, right? And it was only his descendants that were priests. So he was a part of the Levites, that wasn't a tribe, 
So we had the tribe of the Levi, it was the tribe. How many tribes were there? Twelve. Twelve, very good. Yes, there were twelve tribes, and one was Levi. And Aaron was a Levite. So the descendants of Aaron were the priests. The descendants of the other Levites were the Levites. Those were Levites. You read about the priests and the Levites in the New Testament sometimes. The priests and the Levites. So they, they distinguished them because the Levites were not priests. So they were like the sacristans. They took care of the, the church. They were the sacristans. They got provided the uh, things for the mass. They took care of the temple. Uh, and they took care of everything. That was their job. But they weren't priests. So only the ones that were descended from Aaron were priests. So it was a hereditary priesthood. If you were a descendant of Aaron, you were a priest by birth. You were born a priest. And uh, if you were a Levite, you were uh, a sacristan or somebody to take care of the temple, to work around the temple. You were uh, above the faithful, like a cleric or something like this. See? But, uh, so the Levites didn't get, when they divided the land up, the Levites didn't get a portion. Because God said, I'm your portion. So they divided the land into all, for all the other tribes. Uh, and the one tribe was split into two, so they, but they didn't give any land to the Levites. So Levites lived everywhere. They lived in all the other people's lands, see? There were Levites all over the place, and then they took care of the synagogue and the meetings and all this that they had. But the, the priests were uh, in the temple. Yes, they're William. Were the priests allowed to have children? Yes, they, they were required to be married, yes, because they had to, have, they had to provide new priests. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody, everybody, uh, there were no uh, consecrated virgins in the old, in Israel. No, all the girls got married, and all the boys got married. That was the way it was, because they were there to, uh, uh, well, they all hoped to be the father and the mother of the Messiah. Thank you. But then, then when they found out, well, they knew the Messiah was going to be of the tribe of David. Okay, so a sacrifice, the offering of a victim by a priest. So you have to have a victim and you have to have a priest. Both two things. So it might be the lamb. The lamb was the victim and the priest was the one who offered it to God alone and the destruction of it in some way. Why does it have to be destroyed? Alright, let's say you're in a desert, and everybody's really thirsty, and you want to offer a sacrifice to God, and you got a liter of water. So what do you do to offer it to God? You pour it out, yes. And everybody's looking at it, watching those drops go into the desert sand. But you're offering a sacrifice to God. And so you, the destruction of it in some way to acknowledge that he is the creator of all things. How does that acknowledge he's the creator of all things? Emily? Because he's got power for us. Are you killing it for him in a way? Yes. Well. Alright, let's say you pour the water into the sand, desert sand. Okay. Who can use that water? Okay. Yeah. Angela? Only God can use it. See how you can't use it anymore. It's gone for you, but it's still there for God. And if you sacrifice something, God can still use it. So it's a sacrifice to God. So we take it out of out of the union uh, uh, for people, and then we will make it for God. And so we have the offertory first. When we offer something that makes it separated, now it's going to be used for. Uh, the sacrifice of God. So they would offer a, a lamb up, and then they would sacrifice it. See, they wouldn't, offer, they wouldn't sacrifice it right away. We offered a bread and wine up, and then uh, we sacrifice it by the by the mass. We, we don't sacrifice. We sacrifice bread and wine, Joseph. Yes. No, we don't. No. Yeah. Anastasia, do we sacrifice bread and wine? No. No. no we don't. What do we sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Anything? 
Jesus? Jesus, yes, who sacrificed his body and blood, right? Okay. So acknowledge that he's the creator of all things. And see, even the pagans offer sacrifices to their false gods. It's natural for it's natural for people to offer sacrifice to God. So in the false religions, they offer sacrifices up to uh, their idols. Their idols. You can see that still in India. We got a little idol down on the corner street. Where people go and offer sacrifices to it, and they offer incense to it. And they offer other things, you know, and make sacrifices to their idols. So it's natural for men to offer sacrifice uh, to God. <coughs> the first religion that said we don't need a sacrifice was the Protestants. Martin Luther said we don't need a sacrifice. We wanted to get rid of the sacrifice of the Mass. He said we don't need a sacrifice. What was his, what was his reasoning? Does anybody know? Zachary. Is it because um, our Lord already sacrificed himself and he said we don't need to do that's sufficient. We don't need to do any more now. That's right. That's what, that was Martin Luther's false reasoning. That we don't need a sacrifice. So they were the first ones that didn't have a sacrifice. All the, all the peoples in the world. So that was the first one that said we don't need sacrifice. See, it says before the coming of Christ, there were many different sacrifices. They offered, uh, the patriarchs and Jewish priests at the command of God offered fruits, wine, or animals as victims. Cain, for example, offered fruits. Abel offered sheep. Melchizedek, what did Melchizedek offer? Emily? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. Did you know that, Julia? Yes. You did. I was about to say it. Very good. <laughs> Therefore, uh, the destruction of these offerings moved him from man's use and therefore seeing that God is the supreme Lord and master of the entire universe. So they needed many sacrifices. We only have one sacrifice now. In the New Testament, we only have one sacrifice because one sacrifice is far superior to all the Old Testament sacrifices. Our sacrifice is a sacrifice of the body and blood of uh, our Lord, it offers infinite honor and glory to God, whereas the sacrifice of blood of the animals, uh, we say the sacrifice of a heifer, the blood of a heifer could not take away sin. So it could not appease the wrath of God. It was impossible to appease the wrath of God, but uh, we did, they did the best they could do. But they couldn't appease his wrath and his anger by, by, their, by their sacrifices. So it was only our Lord came and he offered the the, the true and proper sacrifice, so we don't offer uh, these sacrifices anymore. Okay, here's a very easy question. Celine, who is the principal priest in every Mass? Jesus. Julia, is your name Celine? Yeah. No. <laughs> is that right, Celine? Uh, yes, it is. We should have said, though, Julia. You should have said the principal priest in every Mass is Jesus Christ. Then you would have got it exactly right. You did get it right, yes, but not exactly right. Okay? Who offers to his heavenly Father through the ministry of his ordained priest his body and blood which were sacrificed on the cross. Okay, why now? This is a hard question. Why is the Mass the same sacrifice as the sacrifice of the cross? Emily? Because on Calvary, or on the cross, Jesus was the victim and the priest, and at, and at the Mass, Jesus is the victim and the priest. So it's got the same victim, Jesus, and it's got the same priest, Jesus. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Principal priest is Jesus Christ. Very good. So that's why it's the same sacrifice. So it's a representation of the same sacrifice. So it says the priest, the principal minister is Jesus Christ. The priest is the visible and secondary minister offering Christ in the Mass. Okay. The most important part of the Mass is the consecration. The consecration, bread and wine, that's when the miracle takes place. Bread and wine are chased into the body and blood of Christ. It was then really present on the altar. What, other, what are the other important parts of the Mass? Everybody should know this. Yeah. 
The community is the important part, yes. Video? Video. Confirmation. What? Confirmation. Confirmation? That's not part of the mass. No. The community in the, the community in yes. I'm like, the offertory? The offertory, yes. The essential parts of the mass are the offertory, the consecration, and the communion. And you have to be present for those parts to be at mass. So if you miss one of those parts, you, you miss mass. Mm -hmm. You have to be present for all those three parts. So the offertory from the time the priest takes the chalice veil off the chalice until the time the priest receives communion, you have to be there or you miss mass. So if you go out to have a smoke or go out to uh, go to the toilet or whatever you might do and during that time, well then you miss mass. Mm -hmm. Afterward. If you just missed a little bit of that. Would that still count as you Yes, you have to be there for the offertory. If you're not there, uh, by the time the chalice veil is removed, well, then uh, you're, uh, you miss Mass. That's why in the, in the mission, sometimes they rang a bell then. They rang the bell. And everybody knew they had to go into church now. If they were out having a smoke or whatever they were doing, they knew, okay, we've got to go into church now. And the priest moved, or otherwise we're going to miss Mass. And then we can't go to communion. So. It was Sunday. It was Sunday mass. Yes, and they ring the bell. Yes. Well, if you have a serious reason, like you stay outside the Sunday, is that? Well, then you miss mass, though, right? Well, if you're in the neighborhood, if you're close to mass, you can be considered part of the being of the mass. But, yeah. We can't. We can't make it too, too precise. You know? but, yes, you have to be there for those three parts. All right. All right, we'll stop now. Go to Rosary. So let's pray. Any questions? William? When did they stop allowing priests to get married? When did they stop allowing priests to get married? Our Lord stopped that. He said, who leaves father and mother and wife, husband and wife and children? So St. Peter left his wife and children to follow our Lord. Follow our Lord. So uh, they did that from the very beginning. Some of, the, some of the apostles were married. Mm -hmm. right. Philip. Well, Philip was a disciple. But... Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm -hmm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.